Hey guys, uh, doing something different now. You notice you actually see me. It's crazy, huh? So uh, I'm going to be cutting back on the number of like little tasks online, and you're just going to be doing highs and lows, watching the video, answering one discussion question. There'll be a couple of them, but you just need to answer at least one of them. If you want to answer more, that's fine. Uh, but that's what we're going to be doing just to sort of make it a little easier for you guys to uh, get things done. So uh, today's topic is sin is my problem. So remember last week you guys watched a video talking about um, is this is sin the devil's fault? Whoa. So this week it's going to be sin is my problem. Um, so let's start out with this. We know sin is real. So we know sin. Uh, we talk about sin as sin is the things we do wrong. So we know we do wrong things. That's not a thing sort of up to do. I, I make mistakes. You make mistakes. We all make mistakes. That's just how it works. So sin is a real thing. Uh, we know it's a reality of the human condition. So doing the math here, it's pretty clear that sin is something we all have to do with, deal with. It's our problem. It's your problem, which is kind of a problem because we all make these mistakes. So what does that mean? So these are sort of these are you're not going to be answering these ones. This is sort of open ended. But why do we resist being responsible for the sin in our lives? When I tell you that sin is your problem, what's the first thing that you think? No, no, it's not. That's how I think. I go, no, I'm not. I don't make mistakes. I'm not like killing people. That's sort of how it is, isn't it? So if everyone sins, why can't we admit it to ourselves? Why do we think that we don't make mistakes, even though we do? And so I think that's it. So let's watch our video, and we'll be learning more about that. Okay, so yesterday I was trying to get Kimmy to come back from the cave she moved into to avoid sin, and today I'm living in that cave. It's been a weird 24 hours. I know this looks extreme, but look at it from my point of view. Sin is literally everywhere in the world, and it's in us and around us. And we just keep sinning against others, and others keep sinning against us, and suddenly Kimmy deciding to become an ascetic and leaving society to avoid sin started to make a lot of sense. I'm not sinning against anyone now, because I don't interact with anyone. Or anything. And yeah, even the sack cloth helps with that. I realized that I didn't really know what went into making my old clothes. Were the workers treated fairly? Were they being exploited? Was the factory destroying the earth? So now I wear organic fair trade material that was originally supposed to be a potato sack <laughs> and it's super itchy. Oh, it's my mom. <laughs> So, life in the cave is pretty, well, not good, but that's kind of the point. I switched to my dad's old phone and downgraded my data plan, plus added about a million parental controls to it, so I'm pretty much completely cut off from society. But Kimmy and I are still trying to go about our lives like normal. She keeps posting on my wall. Of course, since I shut down almost all my social media, it's just that wall over there. Yeah, Kimmy and I almost never see each other around the cave, because that's again kind of the point. But we still aren't getting along great. Like this morning, my rope sandals went missing, and it's not like there's a lot of suspects to pick from. <laughs> Kimmy, I can see you wearing them. Don't just run deeper into the cave. Ugh. 
I'm interacting with only one other person and we still can't avoid sin because it turns out you don't need to have much of anything to be sinful. Look at this. In the fourth century, an ascetic monk named Evagrius Ponticus came up with a list of eight basic temptations or thoughts that would distract people from leading the spiritual life. These eight assaultive thoughts were gluttony, greed, discouragement, sorrow, lust, anger, vainglory, and pride. Wait, why does that sound familiar? Oh, because the sixth century Pope Gregory based his list of seven deadly sins on those thoughts. See, seven deadly sins. You can sin by just thinking. Those are all things that pass through everyone's mind all the time, so how can we possibly escape them? Even in a cave? Well, I guess by living a simple life in a cave, we're sinning less, which is better, right? Come on. Ah, here we go. Good old Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, oh dear. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered among the righteous. So we remain alone with our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. He who is alone with sins is utterly alone. That's ridiculous. He thinks I'm utterly alone just because I'm alone in a cave interacting with no one except Kenny, who I'm constantly fighting with, just thinking about my sins and hopelessness and oh, so broken world. Well, when you put it that way, Bonhoeffer, this whole thing seems to be backfiring. Maybe I'm not trying hard enough. I mean, if I really was serious about this, I wouldn't have a phone at all. They're bad for the earth. They're bad for the people who make them. But if I throw it away, it'll still be bad for the earth. It's like one big inescapable web of sin. Am I just trapped? Okay, one more search. Being in this cave must be good for something. Hmm, Bonhoeffer also says, the more isolated a person is, the more destructive the power of sin over them. Oh, come on, Bonhoeffer, you're saying I'm making things worse? All right, I'll admit, it does feel like this isolation is making things worse, but can anyone tell me why? Let's see, we've got Susan Thistlewaite, a minister, theologian, and author. Oh, and she's a modern one too, nice. So Dr. Thistlewaite says that sin is when we deny our dependence on the other who is God and reject our need for fellow creatures. In other words, sin is a denial of our need of a relationship with God and each other. So cutting myself off from everyone, like by moving into a cave, is a sin. I'm supposed to have relationships, but we also have bad relationships with each other and we mess up our relationship with God. So I'm stuck in this sin either way, in here or out there. Sin is my problem, even though I don't want it to be. This whole situation is totally unfair. But if I stay in the cave, sin is still out there in the world. My being in here doesn't do anything about that. And since sin is my problem, I have to face it. I don't know how, but I have to do something to fix all this. But first, I better let Kimmy know that I'm rejoining society and that I'm sorry for being such a bad roommate. Cavemate, whatever you call it. I'll just post it on her wall. The lesson, Bible reading, going with our video today is from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. So I'll read that now. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. 
Because I know my wrongdoings, my sin is always right in front of me. I've sinned against you, you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born in guilt and sin from the moment my mother conceived me. And yes, you want truth in the most hidden places. You teach me wisdom in the most secret space. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take away your Holy Spirit from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. So this psalm is a prayer of confession and pardon. It's asking God to blot out transgressions and wash me from my iniquity. So our question is, what does this confession tell you about the psalmist's relationship with God? I think what it's telling us is that the psalmist realizes that they've made a mistake. They've made, they've done sin, if you will. They've done wrong things. And it's not that they want God to punish them. It's that they want God to help them be better. And I think that's the whole thing with confession and forgiveness is that we want, is that it's all about God us asking God to make us be better people, to not make these mistakes. But in order to do that, in order for us to sort of get over that edge of realizing that we want God to do help us be better, uh, we have to make and address the fact that we do make mistakes. It's not, you got to confess to God because then God's going to punish you. It's, you got to confess to God so that you know that you make mistakes. So that I know that I've done wrong things, and if I know the wrong things I've done, then I can, with the help of God, be better at not doing those wrong things. And about helping others instead of just thinking about myself and all that other stuff. So I think that's the discussion question um, that I want you guys to look at. So what does this confession tell you about the psalmist's relationship with God? And then uh, there'll be a couple others. So. Uh, I hope you guys have a great week. That's the end of our video. Still going to be short, but uh, answer the couple discussion questions and that'll be it. So have a great week, everyone. Bye.